Living Room Logic. Welcome back everyone to another episode of Living Room Logic. It's a little bit of a solemn one. This is my final episode with Living Room Logic for the foreseeable future and I'll get into why at the end. But don't worry, the podcast will still be going. Andrew's got it in perfect hands. What I really wanted to talk to you about today is climate change, especially because there's this global climate conference on right now. And you may be wondering why it matters, or maybe you don't care a lot about it. Well, this is why you should care about it, because this year scientists have cracked the case on climate change. And world leaders know that they need to act right now. And here is why. So back near the end of last year, the UN came out with their first climate report of their sixth assessment. It was one of the latest reports of the physical science of climate change. And it was about 4,000 pages of a report. It was an absolute chonker. And me and Andrew went through it. I told you... The, the take-home messages from it, it's unequivocal that human influence has increased the global surface temperature by 1.1 degrees Celsius since the late 1800s. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean and biosphere have occurred. Based on current CO2 emission trends, we are on a trajectory towards 3 degrees Celsius of warming by 2100, which is a big No, no. And really, it's a clear message, that report, that our obsession with creating carbon emissions is making Earth hot and more dangerous for us. But how exactly is climate change affecting the human population? Well, the people who wrote the first UN climate report there actually came out with two more reports that are a part two and a part three that were quite important and because of the covid pandemic they kind of left us on red after they came out with that first report and we were kind of like oh my god we're all gonna die what's going on but there's actually a lot of hope and a lot of positivity that comes out of the next two reports the first of those two It's all about the impacts of climate change on people and how we might adapt and how vulnerable we are to climate change. Another massive report, about 3,000 pages long. And again, their opening sentence is quite amazing. I don't want to paraphrase it. This is what they said. Human-induced climate change has caused widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to nature and people beyond natural climate variability. Across sectors and regions, the most vulnerable people and systems are affected the worst. The rise in weather and climate extremes has led to some irreversible impacts as natural and human systems are pushed beyond their ability to adapt, though some adaptation measures have reduced vulnerability. So this is the updated version of their risk and vulnerability assessment of climate change on people. And their new figure is right now about 40% of all people on Earth are highly vulnerable to climate change. But as the report points out, climate change is disproportionately affecting poorer and less developed countries much worse than developed countries. And they actually have this amazing graph about where the vulnerability is low and where it's high on a global setting. And really the major places where people are most vulnerable to climate change and will become more vulnerable are all around the equatorial areas of the world, which makes a lot of sense because these areas are experiencing the most effects of climate change. And not to mention a lot of the countries on the equator have a much lower GDPR and are developing and they're uh, a lot poorer. But mainly it's looking like Central Africa, the, the Horn of Africa, as well as a lot of small island nations, places like in Southeast Asia. And really this is a mix of how developed these countries are, but it's also because of their geography as well, that they're really close to the equator. That's where it's already really hot and we're kind of just at our limits of how hot it can be for humans to survive sustainably. And now it's going over that tipping point 
The other side of that coin is that a lot of the countries in higher latitudes are a lot less vulnerable. But this is not only because the fact that they are further away from the equator, but really it's a lot more to do with the fact that a lot of the societies in higher latitudes are more developed than those closer to the equator. And so they have a lot more resilience, they have a lot more money, they have things that are in place in case large extreme events happen and they can deal with those quite well. Whereas in countries that don't have that infrastructure or that funding for those things, they get affected a hell of a lot worse. Another big thing I got from the report was that the projections that these scientists have made for lowering our emissions to get the earth's temperature to not go over one and a half or two degrees of warming that this actually substantially reduces uh, projected losses and damages related to climate change this is a big thing that they're showing straight from the temperature data to the risk data that once you start going into those higher temperatures up past two degrees, three degrees, four degrees of warming, the risk and the impact are insanely high. They be, they go to the highest of the scale at this 1.5 or at this two degrees scenarios. It's a lot lower and there's a lot less impact and there's a lot less risk. So that's why they've come up with these figures that it's not just they pull them out of their arse. They know that at these temperatures, this minimizes risk and the amount of bad things that will happen to life as we know it right now. Another huge thing that they talk about in this report is something called enabling conditions. It's a little bit of a a hoity-toity way of saying a lot of different things that come from the top of society, things like political commitment, institutional frameworks, policies, the government and these policies keeping up with the science, evaluating these policies and the legislation that is put in and as well financing is a huge thing as well. So these enabling conditions are pretty much the most important thing that needs to be done in terms of adaptation to climate change. And the report goes through every single one of these in extreme detail. But for now, all you need to know is that they lay out clear guidelines for governments on what they need to do to adapt to climate change. There's something that they then talk about a lot in the report as well. It's a thing called climate resilient development. Again, a bit of an annoying jargony word that I wish we didn't need to say a lot, but this is just about the best way to adapt to climate change is to build resilience to it. In the report, there's this amazing figure that they give, and it's a entire city beside a mountain, beside the water, and beside a more rural area. And it's an example of what will happen if you don't have climate resilient development in mind and then what would happen if you do so if you don't have climate in mind when you're trying to develop and be resilient you would use things like high emission energy production you'd let things like invasive plants mess up your agricultural areas and rural areas you'd have reduced food and water security You do things like intensive agriculture with excessive fertilizers. In the water, you do things like have really intensive fisheries and there would be a lot of coastal erosion because there would be no attention paid to how do we stop that. And that would go right up to the edges of these cities and there would be constant flooding or annual flooding causing all sorts of issues. And then on the mountain sides, You would have things like landslides and flooding um, due to low biodiversity and deforestation. Poor planning again on these hillsides would have these sort of informal settlements which things like landslides and flooding can really have a huge effect on in a really bad way. Not to mention again they show this motorway in the middle of it all that's completely chock-a-block with cars. 
and then you know the city getting hit by more storm surges and then further in the ocean you have things like overfishing and your coral reef is bleached and degraded um so you're not getting any of the things we call ecosystem services from the coral reef but then there's like a flip side of that and it's this beautiful green landscape um, and things like up on the mountainside you have reforestation you have healthy soils you have high biodiversity it's preventing those landslides and that flooding and um, you actually have better planning in those informal settlements well they're not informal anymore they're quite formal and they're well planned and then instead of having a big motorway you actually have a a trainway or you have uh, public transport which can help w- uh, reduce emissions massively within the cities you can have green cities and green infrastructure which is really trying to integrate plants and agriculture into cities and use 3d space to actually plant trees and plants and oxygenate the city and keep the temperature down as well and all along the rivers and the coasts you have sediment provision you have mangroves outside the bay which can actually again they can cause several different benefits the first of which is when you get big waves in from a storm the mangroves can take the majority of the brunt but then underneath the mangroves there's actually a huge biodiversity as well which can support local fishermen Um, you have sustainable fisheries around that those uh, areas as well and then in this scenario you also haven't destroyed the reef so you have this beautiful reef ecosystem which is pushing ecotourism which is pushing local fishers which is also uh, supporting a massive biodiverse ecosystem which has lots of different benefits one being a huge way to suck in carbon from the atmosphere and deposit it in the ground but you can also have things like seagrass beds which are very similar in terms of biodiversity and carbon sink that's what we call something that sucks up a lot of carbon um, as well as marine protected areas which can involve seagrass beds and reefs and all of these things mangroves as well so this is the flip side of the coin where when you implement a lot of these good planning and development ideas you start seeing a humongous decrease in carbon emissions and they really give a strong indication exactly what you can do to do this the final take home of this second report is that a certain level of climate adaptation is available and there's a diverse range of things that can be done to adapt but adaptation to this climate change isn't really enough We need to mitigate as well in order to prevent things getting worse. And this is where this third report comes in. It's another 3000 page report that you do not have to read. I read it for you. Um, And it's all about mitigation. Mitigation is like stopping things or not doing something well before the bad thing happens. What we talked about before was adaptation, which is like, oh crap, the thing is right in front of me. Now I have to adapt. Let's use this example to compare mitigation and adaptation. Say there's a hole 10 meters in front of you. Mitigation would be that you had that hole filled in well before it became a really dangerous hole. It was maybe a pothole, then it sunk into a proper sinkhole and now it's this dangerous big hole mitigation would have been oh let's like use better concrete or use better tarmac deal with the water issue underneath the road to stop that hole from forming adaptation is that hole is right in front of you and you just fill it with more tarmac and more soil and it'll just keep happening over and over again But let's talk a little bit more about how these thousands of researchers came up with this amazing report about mitigation of climate change. And there's a lot of good news in this one, the best of which is that there are clear pathways laid out to prevent the Earth's temperature from going past 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. There's two different ways, two different models that they made for that. But there's a lot left to do. And they kind of start off the report with a little bit of a a little bit of bad news 
The average annual greenhouse gas emissions during the last decade were higher than in any previous decade, but the rate of growth in the last decade was lower than the decade before, which is progress. So that's kind of the direct translation of a lot of countries in the last 10 years actually doing things in terms of reducing carbon emissions. So we are still increasing, but the rate of increasing greenhouse gas emissions is dropping. This is showing exactly what the scientists were saying in the first place. If you actually stop, you will see it straight away in the atmosphere. The atmosphere will tell you and it will react fast. But again, much like the way that the earth and different parts and regions of the earth are vulnerable and at risk to climate change, the major emitters of climate change are in certain parts of the world and other parts of the world barely produce any greenhouse gas emissions. And historically, North America, Europe and Eastern Asia are really the big ones in terms of how much greenhouse gas emissions they've chucked into the atmosphere. North America is the highest at 23%. Europe is at 16%. But today, that is changing quite a bit because right now, Eastern Asia is producing a lot, a lot, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, whereas North America and Europe, they did it a lot in the past, but now they're reducing their amounts. Now, that's not to say that North America and Europe are off the hook, because actually in terms of how much greenhouse gas emissions uh, per capita for the total population per region, again, North America is still the highest. Weirdly, Australia, Japan and New Zealand are then the second highest. So it's not as simple as telling everyone to do the same thing. Different countries are producing different amounts of greenhouse gases and it's almost kind of a no-brainer that the countries that went through the Industrial Revolution in the late 19th century, that they are the ones that have produced the most CO2 emissions to date. But it is also interesting that North America is at the top. I would have actually thought personally that Europe would be at the top, but I was wrong. Now, that gives us a good context of what's going on, but the report actually has a lot of really positive things that they talk about. The first of which is that the unit costs of several low emission technologies have fallen continuously since 2010. And they look at things like photovoltaics, so like solar panel um, batteries, um, concentrating solar panel, onshore wind and offshore wind. They've all dropped by a huge amount in the past 10 years, um, especially as well batteries for uh, passenger electric vehicles. And we can see that all of these five things that their adoption has gone kind of on a log- logarithmic increase. So people have really been taken on to these things because these are, as we've been saying for the past kind of 20 years, that these are probably the best things that we can adopt to mitigate climate change and move away from dirty greenhouse gases. So the next thing I want to talk about in the report is really about our commitments so far to greenhouse gas emissions. And the report looks at what we've committed to so far and whether this will be enough to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And they really show that it's not enough. Um, and without strengthening of policies beyond the, the policies that have already been put in place, things like the Paris Agreement and the Glasgow uh, Pact and things like this, greenhouse gas emissions are projected to rise beyond 2025, leading to a median global warming of 3.2 degrees Celsius by 2100. So, you know, don't freak out, but we need to do more. And there's a couple different scenarios that are much more positive that they came up with. Um, There is a scenario where we stop emitting greenhouse gases and transition to much lower carbon emissions at around uh, tomorrow. And the emissions from that drop off really quickly um, to net zero by 2050. 
then if we take our time a little bit more into uh, 2025, that means that, you know, we don't hit net zero straight away and we actually take the longest amount of time if we just do it quite gradually. But then there's even by 2030, if we don't change a lot and then we change quite drastically in 2030, um, we can actually end up hitting net zero quite fast. So there's a couple of different ways that we can get to this 2050 target. And possibly the most important part of this entire mitigation report is that they actually quantified, they put numbers to exactly what mitigation options will cost the most, which will cost the least, and which will have the best impact on reducing emissions. And there's actually lots of options available in all sectors. And the first ones I want to talk about are the ones that will actually make us money. So the long term costs will actually be a negative, will actually make money from them. And the first two biggest ones are wind energy and solar energy. And together you can nearly produce between eight or ten gigatons of carbon a year, which is huge. Then there's other things like avoiding demand for energy services, efficient lighting, appliances and equipment, fuel efficient light duty vehicles, fuel efficient heavy duty vehicles, a shift to public transportation, a shift to bikes and e-bikes. One of the mitigation things that they talk about in this report for the first time ever is called demand side mitigation. And really this is just telling and helping societies change their way of thinking about climate change and about society in general and, and, and what we do and how we do it. Tweaking our behavior towards more green living. Um, and this is something that could actually reduce global greenhouse gas emissions in the consumable sector by between 40 and 70% by 2050. So the majority of the greenhouse gas emissions that we create are because of a lot of things being at our fingertips. So things like getting your clothes from China or getting certain things from China when you can get them from home or from the States or from whatever, making us more used to just buying things closer to us that won't have such a huge carbon impact is something that we need to do and governments will need to put huge amounts of time and effort and money into helping us change our mindsets a little it's not a huge change and it will just be a slow transition but it will be towards a kind of cleaner greener mindset that oh i might not actually get that flight over to the other side of the country i'll get on the bus i'll get on the train i'll use public transport i'll use my electric car so there's lots of different things that you can do now there is one thing that they talk about in the mitigation options that i'm not so much a fan of and a lot of people have been saying mm, i don't know about that because it's kind of a bad idea but this is carbon capture and storage and this is the idea that you can just build a machine that just sucks carbon out of the atmosphere and it sounds fantastic and it sounds like if we just put a load of those around the world that we did, wouldn't even need to change and we could just keep doing what we're doing in terms of how much we consume and how much we move around and how inefficiently we do it. But this carbon capture and storage is actually really expensive and the report kind of says this as well though they also say that a small amount of it will probably need to be done so it's a little bit alarming that they're saying we're gonna have to go full scale with a lot of these carbon capture and storage technologies that i'm pretty sure haven't been fully implemented at the scale that we will need them to be at so that's one thing that's a little cause for concern so all of these lower costing mitigation options that I was talking about, wind, solar, demand side stuff, so changing our behavior a bit, energy efficiency, fuel efficiency, a shift to public transport and e-bikes and cycling and, and even sustainable food diets, all of this can, together, all this cheaper stuff 
can reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by at least half by 2030. And the really cool thing is that global GDP continues to grow in model pathways, but without accounting for the economic benefits of mitigation action from avoided damages from climate change, nor from reduced adaptation costs, it's a few percent lower in 2050 compared to pathways without mitigation beyond current policies. So the global economic benefit of limiting warming to 2 degrees Celsius is reported to exceed the cost of mitigation. This mitigation is huge because there's a lot of hope about it and it shows that if we mitigate we're actually going to benefit from it hugely in several different ways and not even saying that there's multiple pathways to get to net zero across almost every sector which would be very good for world leaders to hear as they'll be able to cater their emission reduction plans based on their economic strengths and weaknesses. And on top of that, reducing carbon emissions is actually going to make the world a lot more sustainable and resilient to change. And I'll use Ireland as an example because that's where I'm from. Our best strategy to reach net zero by 2050 is offshore wind. I actually interviewed a offshore wind expert who's doing research in Ireland right now and it looks like it's about to pop off and explode and it's going to be really good for the country. And it's not just going to be good for the country in terms of climate change. That's literally just one thing that it will benefit. It is a huge benefit to be able to say, oh, we're doing good. We are actually green. We're net zero or we're actually negative in terms of carbon. We're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, which will only help the world more. But on top of the climate change side of things, if Ireland had a huge offshore wind resource, and if we were using it properly and sustainably, and we planned it really well, and we owned quite a lot of it publicly, we would be one of the most energy resilient and energy rich countries in Europe. We would have so much energy that we really would just need to work on technologies for how to store it and how to send it to Europe. At that stage, you could see a scenario where Ireland actually increases its GDP by quite a bit and our lives here in Ireland get a lot more easy. A lot more money flowing through the economy would mean a lot better cost of living, much more jobs, especially in green industries. And with the extra money in the economy, we could push towards things like increased public transport, helping people change their behaviors a bit and how we think about consuming and moving. You know, could you imagine a public transport system like a tram or like an underground in Dublin, an extension of the Lewis in Galway and Cork, all these different cities in Ireland that desperately need changes to their transport systems, not only because of climate, just because they're crap, they're really bad. People suffer hours and hours of commuting every day, and I'm sure that's a global issue, not anything to do with Ireland on its own. So you can see that there's like multiple benefits from tackling this climate crisis. Not only does it stop the world from being less habitable for humans, which is what three, four, five degrees of warming would do, it actually potentially creates a lot of jobs in, in much of the world. It makes the air cleaner. It can make us healthier. It can improve our physical and mental health. So lads, the evidence is pretty clear. We need to make much deeper cuts to carbon emissions globally. And the one big elephant in the room is financing a lot of this, especially for poor developing countries who still need to develop which will be a major talking point at this conference that's going on right now that I talked about at the start of the episode, COP27. What the hell is COP27? Well, it's the conference of the parties. It's all of the UN countries get together and they talk about climate change 
And it's happening right now, November 2022, in Egypt. And they have four main goals. They want to tackle mitigation, adaptation, finance and collaboration about climate change. Now, I've listened to a lot of these cops before and not a lot comes from everything that is said. And a lot of climate scientists will tell you this, that they take a lot of things that are said at the cops with a pinch of salt. But here's the thing. This is the first cop where we've had all of this information. Those UN climate reports are the most solid, damning bits of information that fossil fuels and high heavy carbon industries are just not part of a good future and that we need to change the way that we make energy and how we use fuel and how we think about these things as well. So there needs to be change and it needs to be now, not in five years, not in 10 years. And those second and third reports show that, that if you keep waiting to act, bad things happen pretty damn soon. If we do nothing business as usual, even with our current climate goals, you're talking an increase, an overshoot of that 1.5 towards 3 degrees Celsius. At that point, any more adaptation and things like that will probably go out the window and it'll just be quite a different world. So the time to act is now. And have a look at the COP27, how it turns out, because COP26 uh, it was a little bit of a disaster. A lot of people said a lot of stuff and then not much was actually done in terms of goals. So this is the one where goals need to be doubled, tripled in terms of how much greenhouse gas emissions countries can reduce. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was my advice for what you can do, because a lot of people will probably be listening to this being like, OK, this is all great and all, but I don't really know what how this relates to me. And so I kind of came up with some personal actions that you can take to really feel like you're a part of this because you are and you will be and you must be. Everyone has to really help and they can't. There's so many things you can do. So I broke down into two things, personal actions and community and social actions. Personal things, you can make sure you are doing whatever you can within your means, talking about your budget and your time to lower your carbon footprint as much as possible. Things like lowering the temperature of your washes, recycling as much as you can, reducing food waste. And this helps with having a compost bin, not using single use plastics, use keep cups and thermoses instead, eat less meat or just eat less red meat. White meat is a lot better for the environment, especially things like chicken. Fish is not as much in terms of sustainability, but that will also change with sustainable fishing as we move forward. So in terms of that, eating more sustainable foods, So basically don't eat things like bananas and avocados that flew in from a thousand miles away. Buy products from your country whenever possible. Use public transport. Cycle, walk, use e-transport like e-bikes and uh, e-scooters when you can. Switch to an electric car if you have the money. Again, retrofit your house if you have the money. Get it better insulated, get those insulation beads. That's a a lot cheaper than retrofitting your house and it will also help. Get solar panels on your roof. Upgrade to a biofuel heating system. Plant local indigenous plants in your garden. Plant wildflower gardens. And the list goes on and on and on. In terms of finances, check that your financial investments aren't involved in companies that are part of the emissions problem. I read a fact yesterday that in England about 5% of every single person's pension is invested in fossil fuel companies or derivatives of those companies. So ask your pension provider whether your pension can back neutral or positive companies instead, such as renewable energy companies, which are also experiencing massive growth at the moment, which is never a bad thing financially. Now, in terms of community and social actions, check that your government are implementing carbon reductions that are sufficient to reach net zero in your country by 2050. 
ask your local government representative about what they're doing about the climate crisis and making Ireland more sustainable and resilient. If you're not happy with their answer, you can vote for a person or a party with better climate and sustainable development plans. Let your friends, family and co-workers know about your own personal climate actions so that they make changes too and also pressure government representatives to do more climate action just like you were doing. You can protest peacefully about the climate crisis and climate action. There are regular protests in most cities every few months about climate change and the climate crisis and what we need to do. Finally, bring this problem forward in your community when you can. Community engagement is key to getting people to think about this issue more and in a positive and compassionate way where people are coming together and working together rather than being divided by gaps in understanding and misinformation. Sit down with people that you don't think that you would sit down with and just have a chat with them. Understand them, let them say what they think. You can try and help them understand where your fears and where your anxieties are about this and why you're acting towards preventing climate change. And maybe you just might actually change that person's mind and become more connected to people that you think you wouldn't be. So that's pretty much it for my final podcast on Living Room Logic. It's a time of crazy change in the world and it's also a time of a lot of suffering especially over the last two years but it also showed over the last two years or three years that humans can change the way they think and the way they act and the way they do things so i think that if we can sit in our rooms and stay at home for two years we can change our diet a bit we can get on the bike a bit more we can push our governments a little bit towards green stuff it's actually forcing us to make our lives better rather than make our lives worse which is what the pandemic did so if you were able to do that you will be able to do this so i'm leaving the podcast uh, mainly because i'm moving to australia with my partner and me and Andrew decided that it was going to be a bit too hard. Well, I decided. Andrew was sad, understandably, that I just wouldn't be able to do it over there. But Australia isn't the only reason. To be honest, I've had less and less time to put 100% into the podcast. And I think a good comparison is when I was in the pandemic with Andrew and we were doing this together through Zoom. We had so much time on our hands and this was actually an amazing way for us to escape and to still be creative and to put our heart and soul into something that we're really passionate about. And I am still very passionate about this podcast and about communicating science. But what I've noticed is since restrictions lifted, a lot has changed in my life. I moved in with my partner. I no longer had all the time in the world. I started working in an office again and I get home now and I barely have any time to do anything and, and I want to spend time with the people that I love. So I'm finding there's way less time in the day for me to work on the podcast, unfortunately. If I had more time in the day, I would absolutely love to do it. But right now, with the amount of spare time that I have, I can't give the podcast as much passion and energy as I think it deserves and that's my reason. Oh and one last thing, Andrew is going to take this podcast to new heights. I know the vision he has for the podcast moving forward and it sounds really interesting. It also sounds quite sustainable for him. You know he also works a full-time job that isn't the podcast and has loved ones and everything else just like me. This is how much he wants to keep it going and how much he cares about it and he's going to do fantastic things with it and I just want to thank him thank you Andrew for bringing me on this journey it's probably been one of the coolest things I've ever done in terms of creativity in terms of learning how to communicate science and how to do everything to do with telling a story and keeping people engaged and listening and sometimes when me and you are chatting, we just kind of lose ourselves and get into this proper creative flow. And listening back to our podcast is something that I'm going to do throughout my life with such nostalgia 
and pride. So thank you. So this is uh, Aiden signing off from Living Room Logic, but I'll probably come on every now and again to chat about something, especially to do with climate change, because Andrew hasn't a fucking clue. God bless you. This is the end of the podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time. If you're feeling generous and you're not completely skinned, why don't you give us some of your money? Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon.